If you have your Bibles, they'll open to Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4. And I tell you what, what uh, God wants to do some neat things during this time. He wants to do some amazing things during this time. And I'm glad to be a part of a tremendous ministry and to serve such a great God. Philippians chapter number 4, where I have entitled the message tonight, The Fill For Test. All right, The Fill For Test, obviously a playoff on the current test out there. And in Philippians chapter number 4, Paul is speaking to a group of people who have some troubles, who have some worries, who have some concerns, and he brings a very applicable, a very challenging, a very um, maybe supernatural thought to them. If you would look in Philippians chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 5, we'll look at 5, 6, and 7, where Paul writes, Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Don't forget that God is close. The Lord is at hand. He is nearby. He is not very far. Throughout the Bible, we see the, clo the closeness of God. And just when people thought God wasn't close, he showed him how close he was. Sometimes by walking on water. Sometimes with a still, small voice. Sometimes with amazing fire. But God is close. And he is at hand. Verse number 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus Lord I thank you for this time we have tonight Lord I ask for your help Lord for your grace Lord I ask your help on myself as I preach Lord I can't preach without you Lord I don't want to preach without you Lord, I need you tonight. Help me with your power and your spirit. Help me to say those things that would be clear and helpful through your word to our congregation. Lord, help those who are listening, whether here or online in their homes or some other location, that their hearts would be open to the truth from your word, that it would not just be words that I speak, but they would be words from you. Lord, touch us, change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Someone said it this way, what lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters when compared to what lies within us. What is in front of us and what's behind us is very small compared to the power of God that resides in Christians, the Holy Spirit, who lies within us. And no matter what the problem is, God is bigger than that. No matter what the worry is, God is stronger than that. A recently licensed pilot was flying his private airplane on a cloudy day. He apparently was not very experienced in instrument landing. When the control tower was to bring him in, he began to be become panicked and have anxiety. And then a stern voice came over the radio you just obey the instructions. We'll take care of the obstructions. Oh, that's good advice. We just obey instructions and let God take care of the obstructions. Speaking of, of airlines and pilots, there was a very nervous airline passenger. Now, I've been able to fly a number of times. I typically do not get nervous when I fly. There is not much that uh, makes me nervous on an airplane. All right, even dropping some 1,000 or 500 feet. I mean, here's what's going to happen. You're going to live or you're not. All right? So I don't get too nervous when I fly. Uh, can't remember the last time I was nervous on a flight, but there was a nervous airline passenger that I read about who began pacing in a terminal when bad weather delayed his flight. During his walk to the terminal, he came across a life insurance vending machine. And for just $3 he could purchase $100,000 of life insurance in the event that his airplane were to crash. Well, he looked outside the window of the terminal and just saw the ominous clouds out there as the story goes, and, and he thought of his family at home and the needs they would have if for some reason this airplane crashed. And, and so he paid the 3 bucks and got the $100,000 worth of coverage. Well, that time flight was so delayed, so he was hungry, so he looked for a restaurant and he found a Chinese restaurant. He was enjoying the Chinese food, and it was a great meal until he got to the fortune cookie, which read, your recent investment will pay big dividends. 
That'll make you worry. The fact is, uh, we sometimes fall into that category where we observe a fortune cookie and the foolishness of that more than the Word of God. Where we, where we allow our mind to walk down a path that has no more credibility than a fortune cookie. And I'm with you. I enjoy reading fortune cookies, but I don't make investments based off fortune cookies. I don't make life decisions based off fortune cookies. I merely read them, add a phrase on the end, and laugh at how funny they seem. Yet we're sometimes guilty of that in our minds. We hear something, we observe something, and we forget the very power that lies within us. We bring our attention to the Philippians 4, the Phil 4 test. I see three parts to this test. The first thing that I observe in this test is there needs to be an honesty. There needs to be an honesty. If you look at that verse number 5, where the Bible says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. There needs to be an honesty. There's an honesty in that we need to be appropriate. We need to be gentle in spirit. I see in this verse that there's an observation of others. Let your moderation be known unto all men. There's an observation of others. I would ask you tonight, what are you known for? What do others know you for? Some may know you for tremendous recipes that you post on Pinterest and Facebook. You may be known for ranting and raving on social media. You may be known for worry. That's where we go in verse number five. What are you known for? There needs to be an honesty. Am I walking in the spirit or am I walking in the flesh? What am I known for? Am I walking by faith or am I walking by fear? What am I known for? Am I prone to anxiety and allowing that to not dominate my mind and my conversation? What am I known for? Have I br bridled the passions of my mind? What Am I known for? Let your moderation be known unto all men. There has to be an honesty with the observation of others. Well, 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 Pastor, I am I am known as just a tremendous fill in the blank. But it may not be honest. You may ask someone else and they may tell you, well, really, you're just a worry wart. Really, you're just a, a complainer. Let your moderation be known. Make sure we bridle the passions of our mind. It brings me to a tremendous story that I have never told here, though Pastor Scott has told here. The story of the time that I had to bridle a horse. And I was on a mission trip. Some of you were there this happens here night with the, helping us with music. You heard her for the offertory, and she, I think, remembers this particular story. We're up in Canada, and, and I do not like horses. All right, I know that now it's going to get blown up on Facebook. You know, Pastor, I was against animals. Well, that's not a surprise, all right? And uh, you wonder, well, this may be why I don't buy Dorina Pony, all right? This story may be the reason. But uh, we were in Canada, and um, the, the missionary there, Pastor Len Crow, was a tremendous horseman. Is that the right word, horseman? Okay, I don't even know what they call him. Horseman, cowboy. He was a cowboy, all right? And he had these three horses, general a mare that was General's girlfriend, and then some other horse. And uh, when we got up there, Pastor Crow liked to ride horses, and Pastor Cowling was with us. He grew up riding horses, and my wife grew up riding horses as well. We get up there, and, and uh, Pastor Crow asked us, he said, well, do you guys want to go riding horses? And Pastor Scott's like, absolutely. We'll go on moonlit rides at night. My wife's like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. To, she says, well, smell the smell of horse. All right, now... I've smelled horses before, and it's nothing that I just run back to. It's not like I'm like, oh, I can't wait to go smell more horse. Um, it's just, I don't know. It's, it must be me. It must be me. And uh, anyway, uh, they invited me the first night. Do you want to go with us on this ride in the dark on horses? No. No, I don't. I don't want to ride a horse during the day, and I don't want to ride it at dark where I have no clue what I'm doing. I have never professed to be a good horse back rider, horse rider, horseman, or cowboy. All right, I've not, I've not made that. It'd be different if I'd made that claim, but I have not. All right, I have not. I've ridden horses two or three times in my life, and that was it, always in a controlled environment. Okay, controlled environment meaning like you pay a nickel and you get on there at Myers and you get off it, okay? Something like that. So, 
anyway, they went out the first couple nights and I guess had a great time together. I mean, what, what could possibly be better than riding a horse at, at, in, a, in a moonlight ride, they would, you know, they, they would ask. And, and I would submit there are many things better than riding a horse in the moonlight ride. I mean, going to the dentist, a root canal, perhaps. I mean, many things I could, I could possibly think of. So anyway, the, the very last day, I believe it's the last day we're there, um, my wife had gone riding and uh, Pastor Scott had gone riding and then Pastor Scott comes back and he says, listen, J.D., you need to go and jump on General and go ride the horse with your wife. My wife was across the field. Okay, it was a big field, bales of hay in this field and it, gopher holes. I think there are gophers that make all these holes. Very dangerous, apparently, for a horse. Who knew? So he's like, go, you know, go, go, uh, go jump on this horse and go, go find your wife. Well, they'd been riding earlier and they had wanted to make sure the horses, they're a little bit restless. So they wanted to make sure they weren't, you know, um, I don't know, galloping them or, or making them too, working them too hard. So they'd kind of calm them down. So for whatever reason, I, I lost my mind and I was in my insanity for a moment. And I, I got on this horse and listened to the pastor cowling. And that, my friends, was my first mistake. <laughs> As I'm on this horse by the horse barn in this horse yard my wife's across the field um i'm sitting there and i asked pastor scott how do you stop this thing and he said pull back on the reins all right so i'm holding like this and i and i pulled back like this okay now those who ride horses are like oh pastor you're doing it all wrong i know <laughs> i never claimed to do it all right okay so i pulled back on the reins and of course general reared up a little bit I felt like I was going to fall off, so I tightened my heels around his girth. Is that what it's called? His girth? Okay. They're, they're, they're telling me I'm getting the right terminology. His girth. Well, a little known fact about General. Pastor Len Crow had trained General to be one of the fastest Pony Express horses in all of Canada. Okay? And, and he would, I mean, like, known in Canada for the speed that he would run this Pony Express runs. In fact, he, they would run them and time them. And General was, if not the fastest, one of the fastest uh, verified in Canada. He was trained to jump out of the gate on two heels touching his girth. I didn't know this until my heels touch his girth. General takes off across the field toward my wife and the horse she's on, the mare that he likes. I am praying and holding on for dear life. <laughs> As I'm going across the field, my wife is observing me ride across the field and, and she, is, she tells me afterwards, she's thinking, what is Pastor Cowling doing? We said we're going to sell these horses down. Why is he riding General so hard across the field? Pastor Cowling is thinking, what is J.D. doing? General is going to step into a gopher hole, snap General's leg, and he'll have to be put down. What, he's going to kill this horse. He's going to ruin this horse. I'm thinking, dear God, let me live. <laughs> As I come closer to Doreen, she realizes it's not Pastor Cowling. It's actually me. She's like, what's J.D. doing? He doesn't know how to ride a horse. She was so right. General, through no effort of my own, runs all the way to where Dreen's at and slams on his brakes. Stops her. She goes, what are you doing with like this pent-up frustration because caring much more for the horse than for her husband? And that's a sermon. I'll come back to that sermon when you care more for the horse than for the husband. All right, I guarantee I'll find a good Bible passage about that. We'll build the whole sermon around that concept. And then I'll fill some Bible at the end. It'll, it'll be good. So tune in for that one. Uh, we'll figure out when we get that one. And honey, make sure you listen. Uh, that, uh, when you care for the horse more than the husband. Anyway, I asked her. She goes, what are you doing? I said, and I repeated my question that I asked previously, how do you stop this thing? And she said the same thing Pastor Kelly said. You pull back on the reins. So I'm still like this, and I pull back on the reins again. And General, once again, rears up. I once again feel like I'm about to fall off. And I tighten up my heels one more time and general shoots off across the field back to where i started now i remember this those times when your life slows down this was one of those times and this has been verified pastor scott um has verified this my wife verified this when i'm on that horse i felt like i was in a full gallop what they have both told me is that this horse was galloping and all four legs were off the ground at the same time he was in a full sprint at that moment I remember that I'm watching this, bri this bridle in his mouth move to the front of his teeth in slow motion, his ears laid back on him. And at that point, I, am th I remember thinking, Lord, let me, don't let me die. He's racing back toward, toward the, the, the corral where I started. 
He came flying in there, missed every gopher hole, praise the Lord for that, came around the corner, whipped around the corner, all right? When he whipped around the corner, the saddle apparently wasn't tightened uh, well enough, so as he whipped around the corner, the saddle loosened up, I fell off the horse on the ground, he slams on his brake, and I'm looking on the ground, looking up at this horse and his girth right there. <laughs> Pastor Scott asks, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just praising the Lord. <laughs> That I'm on, that I'm on dirt. <laughs> I've never loved dirt so much in my life. Amen. No matter what I did at that moment, I could not bridle the passions of that horse. General was doing what General wanted to do. Yeah. I'm not experienced horseman. I'm not experienced cowboy. I'm not experienced horse rider. I merely held on for dear life. And this verse says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The observation of others that we bridle the passions of our mind. You see, our mind, if we're not careful, especially at a time like this. Can we just be honest? Can we just be family for a moment? At a time like this, the, 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 the crisis that we're facing and the, the sensationalism of the news, and everywhere you turn, everywhere you turn, it is, it is sensationalized. I'm not saying that there's not a problem. There is a problem out there. I understand that. What, I'm, what I am saying, though, is that every time you turn on the TV, you go onto Facebook, you go to these news, these news locations, whether, whether on your phone or on TV, they're all sensationalizing it. And, and if you're not careful, your mind will run a hundred times faster than General did on that. You will feel the same worry about your life that I felt in reality. And the fact is, I was in a whole lot more danger on that horse, running through a field, not in control, among gopher holes over the entire field. We were warned about them when we got there. I was in a whole lot more danger than we are right now. Yet our minds are running a thousand miles an hour, unbridled. There has to be an honesty that there's an observation of others, but there's also an observation of the Lord. That's what the, the next verse will talk about. And, and the end of, it, of this one says that the Lord is at hand. You see, I'd ask you if others know us to be a bridal, uh, to be a worrier. But does God know me to be a worrier? He knows the innermost thoughts of my heart and intents of my heart. He knows what I'm really like. He knows what bothers me. Does God know me to be a worrier? These following verses, uh, 5 and verses 6 and 7, speak specifically about my trust in my God. In the book of Matthew, there's the account told of Jesus and the centurion. The centurion had a sick servant. He came to Jesus for the healing of the servant, and, and the, the centurion said to Jesus, You don't need to come. If you just speak the words, then he'll be healed. He mentioned to the Lord, I have men under me, and I understand if I say to go here and to go here, you do it. He said, just speak the disease away, it'll be gone. And Jesus, the scripture said, marveled at this man's faith. He marveled. He observed it. I wonder if right now in 2020, on March the 25th, if Jesus is marveling at any of our faith, or, is, or, or if he is observing some worry. I wonder if your faith or my faith has caused the Son of God to marvel. You see, there needs to be an honesty about the situation. An honesty about this test. But second of all, there needs to be a heeding. Verse number 6 says this, Be careful for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. There needs to be a heeding. What do we follow? Well, the scripture tells us, first of all, to do, to do this, be careful for nothing. Nothing should cause my mind to jump ship. Nothing should overrun my mind with negativity and abandonment. Nothing should uh, uh, cause the worry in my mind to be able to find a place to park. There is a no parking sign in my mind for worry. Be careful for nothing. Worry, you're not welcome in my mind. You may drive through my mind, and there are some things that will drive through that I can't control, but I can control if they park in my mind. 
And I don't want them to park. They, there's no parking. This is reserved spaces for the power of God and His Word, not for worry in my life and in my mind. Be careful for nothing. There's no parking spaces available. There's no ground for worry to be planted in. Sorry, this soil of my mind and my heart is reserved for the truth from God's Word. I want to be good soil for that, not good soil for worry. Not because I'm strong. Not because we're made this way. But because God commands us to be this way. If it was based on my strength, we would fail. I would fail. Maybe I would fail at a different spot than you fail, and maybe before some and after others, but I would still fail if it's my strength, if it's my decision. Not because I'm strong, not because I was raised this way, but because God has commanded me to give no place, no soil, no parking spots to worry in my mind. It seems that there was a talented young man in the Midwest during the time there were some terrible fires in Yellowstone National Park, this young man was, was tasked to capture the fires with a camera and capture the crisis on film. And so a well-known magazine hired the young man to picture this disaster for their cover. The young man packed his bags and his camera and film and left on assignment for the fires at Yellowstone National Park. When the young photographer arrived, he ran into a problem. He realized that the smoke was so dark and so thick, it was impossible to get the pictures of the scenes from the ground. So he called the magazine office and asked for permission to charter a small plane so he could take pictures from overhead. Well, the magazine made arrangements at a local airport, and the call returned to him that a small plane would be waiting on the runway. He jumped into his rental car, and away he rushed to the airport. There was a really young man sitting in the small single engine aircraft. And as instructed, the plane's engine was fueled and warned for takeoff. The young photog photographer, with his cameras and film, threw all his gear in the back seat, closed the door, and said, Ready for takeoff. And the young man proceeded down the runway. The plane was shaking and very rough when the air, the pilot asked, How was that? And the pilot seemed very nervous, but, you know, the little plane lifted higher, higher into the wind. The young, talented photographer had not experienced such a jerky flight, but he re requested the pilot to fly, fly over the park and to fly really low near the fires. Now, why, asked the pilot. Well, the young man replied, I'm on assignment. I'm a, I'm a photographer, and photographers need to be close to the action to take photographs. The story goes, the pilot was very silent for a few minutes. And then he broke the silence and said, And I thought you were the flight instructor. You know what? Sometimes life isn't what it seems, is it? <laughs> Sometimes we say, well, Pastor, you understand I have to worry because I was surprised. I thought that was the flight instructor. But the Bible doesn't give me an avenue of escape and worry. The Bible doesn't give me a, an exception for my life or my problems. The Bible says, be careful for nothing. Amen. And then it commands me and you and I to be consistent in prayer. Be careful for nothing, but be consistent in prayer. Can I ask you tonight, how's your prayer life right now? Some have been home more now than they have been in weeks or months. More time, but I wonder if God's gotten more time. I wonder if his prayer, if our prayer has taken a turn uh, for, for the better. The Bible says here, with supplication and thanksgiving, or asking for requests and thanking for the blessings. I am always amazed at seeing God work through times that appear to be difficult. It's just amazing what God is doing, even now, during this time of pandemic and crisis, how God is not only working, but working in great ways. And people touched by the gospel, people encouraged by prayer in ways that God is opening doors that have never been opened before. God is doing something, not only helping us survive, but helping us go forward. We thanking him for the blessings. You say, well, pastor, you just got laid off. Have you prayed about it? Have you made your request known? It's okay. Lord, 
I need money. And I need a lot of it. Let your requests be made known unto God. You can ask Him those things, but with thanksgiving, Lord, I know you're going to work. And watch for Him to work. Lord, I'm worried about getting sick. Let Him know your requests. With thanksgiving, but Lord, I know that you're the great physician. With thanksgiving, be careful for nothing, but be consistent in prayer. You see, there's a honesty, a heeding, and lastly tonight, I'd like to look at this, verse number 7, there's a humility. There's a humility in the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If I could to turn your attention in verse number 7, there's a dependence on Him, His peace. And there's three words I have to describe this piece tonight. It is inconceivable, it is incomprehensible, and it is inexhaustible. It is inconceivable, it is incomprehensible, and it is inexhaustible. I cannot help but when I hear the word inconceivable to re be reminded of the movie The Princess Bride. I'm sure there's enough old people around watching this and in this room tonight to remember The Princess Bride. And the line that says, you keep on saying that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. Inconceivable. This peace of God that God brings is inconceivable. It doesn't make any sense. Why should we have, sense, or why should we have peace in a time of crisis? Because God brings it. <laughs> it's inconceivable. Why can someone going through a terrible tragedy still have a, a calmness and a quietness in their mind and in their soul? Because it's the peace of God. It's not natural. It's supernatural. It's inconceivable. In Japan, they sell Godzilla meat. Godzilla meat. It's actually three and a half ounces of corned beef, and it's sold by the uh, toy maker Takakara, uh, Takara Company, but they label it as want to be as strong as Godzilla, eat Godzilla meat. Someone said it this way, it's like Popeye and his can of spinach. But we know that you can eat three and a half ounces of corned beef and you will not be as strong as Godzilla. But you can spend three and a half minutes in prayer with the God Almighty, the maker of the universe. And he can make you as strong as he is. The peace of God is inconceivable. It's incomprehensible. It passes all understanding. It doesn't make sense. I can't figure it out. You can't figure it out. That's what he, why he, he says. It passes all understanding. It is more confusing than computers are to the older generation. More confusing than uh, maybe commitment to millennials. More confusing than that. Can I get all generations? And, and more confusing than quantum physics to kindergarten students. It's incomprehensible. And it's inexhaustible. It's never, ever going to wear out. We can have it today, tomorrow. You can have it. I can have it. Everyone who's under this voice and at home or, or, or uh, in the auditorium can have it. And it is inexhaustible. It'll keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. The reason it never fails is because it is powered by God Almighty. It is better than any Energizer Bunny. Remember those commercials? Energizer Bunny hammering that hammer never stops. Peace of God through Christ Jesus never stops. I'm on an airplane kick tonight, so I'll end with one more illustration of airplanes. There was a pastor who was on a long flight from one place to another. And the first warning of approaching problems came when the sign on the airplane flashed, Fasten your seatbelts. Then after a while, a calm voice said, we shall not be serving beverages at this time as we're expecting a little turbulence. One of the worst announcements on an aircraft. Not turbulence, just lack of beverages. Please be sure to keep your seatbelt fastened. As his pastor looked around the aircraft, it became obvious that many of the passengers were beginning to become worried and apprehensive. Later, the voice of the announcer came back on. And said, we are so sorry that we're unable to serve the meal at this time. The turbulence is still ahead of us. And then the storm broke, the pastor said. The ominous cracks of thunder could be heard even above the roar of the engines. Lightning lit up the darkened skies. And within moments, the great plane was like a cork tossed around an ocean. One moment, the airplane was lifted on currents and next dropped as if it were about to crash. The pastor said that he 
he shared the discomfort and fear of those around him. His words, as I looked around the plane, I could see nearly all of the passengers were upset and alarmed. Some were praying the future seemed ominous and many were wondering if they would make it through the storm. Then he said, I suddenly saw a little girl. Apparently the storm meant nothing to her. She had her she had tucked her feet beneath her as she sat on a seat and was reading a book and everything within her small world was calm and orderly. Sometimes, he said, she would close her eyes and she would read again. Then she would straighten her legs. But worry and fear were not a part of her world. While the plane was being buffeted by the terrible storm and it was lurching this way and that and fell and rose with frightening severity and all the adults were scared half to death, that marvelous child was completely composed and totally unafraid. The minister said, I could hardly believe my eyes. He said, when we landed, the plane reached its destination. All the passengers were hurrying to disembark. He lingered to speak to the girl whom he had watched for such a long time. He commented about the storm and the behavior of the plane and asked this young girl why she wasn't afraid. The small girl replied, because my daddy's a pilot, and he's taking me home. She wasn't worried because her dad was the pilot. You know why I'm not worried? Because my dad's the pilot. You know why you don't have to be worried? Because if you're a Christian, your dad is the pilot. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this time we've had tonight. Lord, I can't help but wonder as you brought this message to me and as I've studied it, Lord, that there may not be someone who's under this passage of Scripture tonight, Lord, who needs the calmness and the peace that only you can bring. Lord, I wonder if maybe as I was speaking, you were speaking. Maybe there's a young man or young lady, maybe an older man, older lady, whatever walk of life, who has allowed worry, allowed fear to have a parking space, to find a place to grow. Lord, I ask you to help us to be honest tonight. You're at home, there are some here. Can we take a moment? Those who are here are free to use the altar. Those at home, would you bend a knee? Bend your heart to the Lord. careful for nothing, and be consistent in prayer. And that peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. If you need to do business with God, would you do it now with your heads bowed and eyes closed here and at home? Would you pray? Maybe you're listening tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You don't know that if you die today that you have a home in heaven. God, I encourage you, my friend, you can trust Christ tonight. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe that he died for your, for your sins. Believe that if you trust him, that he'll save you and, and take you to heaven when you die. It's not hard to get saved. It's easy to get saved. Jesus compared it once to taking a drink. It's that easy. Friend, tonight, if you're not sure you have a home in heaven, would you not trust Jesus Christ? Often we help someone pray like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. You can tell him that. Lord, I know I deserve to pay for my sin. He'll hear you. But I believe that you died for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven when I die? I trust you and you alone. I encourage you, my friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, that you trust him tonight. Don't let another evening pass without knowing your eternal home. A Christian, if, you'd allow, if you have allowed worry, to find a place in your mind, in your heart. I hope that with God's power, His grace, you'll find the victory. Lord, I thank you for your word, for the time we have. Lord, I pray for all those who, Lord, I believe are touched by your word. Lord, if there's someone under the power, sound of my voice, who has never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, I pray they do that tonight. Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us and all you will do. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.